Super, so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Lex Kravitz to the COST group um, and any associated friends and colleagues today. So I believe, Lex, you did your PhD at University of Pennsylvania. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I meant to check with yeah. you before we started, but we got discussing <laughs> other got, items. You got the right, Lex. Excellent. And then um, Lex went on to do a postdoc with Anatole Kreitzer at UCSF. Still correct? And then um, before starting his own lab at NIDDK, um, and then he moved a few years ago now, maybe five years ago? I think four. Four so years ago. <laughs> okay, here we go. To uh, Washington University in St. Louis. Um, at just a little bit about, say, scientifically, Lex's research has really focused on um, the role of the basal ganglia in particularly movement, reward, activity, exercise, and he's made some really important seminal contributions there. Um, but maybe the most important reason for inviting him today is because of the contributions he's made to in terms of open hardware for behavioral experiments in particular, but also other, other forms of uh, rodent experiments. Um, and so we talk about one device uh, a lot probably today, the FEDS or feeding experimentation device that um, many people have started using now. Um, and um, along these lines, he's also was the co-founder of the website Open Behavior, where you can find collected together um, a sort of community source of different um, both hardware and software projects, um, which has really become an invaluable resource, I think, for the community. So without further ado, I'll let Lex share his screen and tell us um, all about open source approaches for studying home cage behavior. Thanks, Lex. Well, thank you, Jamie. And um, yeah, thanks for inviting me. I, I've, uh, I know many of the names on the Zoom, either from your papers or have interacted with some of you directly. Um, and this is really great. Um, I, have a, I have time for discussion um, and um, so feel free to jump in. I'm not sure. It's kind of hard for me to monitor the chat. So maybe um, maybe just jump in, just unmute yourself and jump in if, if you have anything you'd like to discuss. Um, first kind of interesting discussion point is that some of what I'm going to talk about today is going to be is going to be meaning we have not sold one yet, but um, in theory, we will commercialize some of what the a ladder device I'll talk about by a company called Paladis. Um, that I've started with another small business here in the US um, that we've been working on some hardware with. And this may be an interesting point if anyone was on you know, five minutes before we started, Evelina and Jamie and I were talking about the challenges of dissemination. Um, and I would sort of, I, I have a lot, thought about this a lot. Um, we've disseminated things through open source, met, open source methods, which I think has huge benefits for if you don't think you're gonna make a million dollars. Um, it is a great way to disseminate something, um, but it's also challenging. It's hard to support it. Um, there's not really money coming in, so everything is volunteer based. And um, and then some things when the when the amount of effort you know for each person that wants to use it is too much, um, commercialization can be a great option because in theory you'd have money coming in, and therefore you can pay somebody to do support or training, and um, and that's sort of how how a lot of um, scientific technology gets disseminated is, of course, through commercial companies. So I'm going to start by talking about Fed3, and then I'll talk a little bit about Paladis at the end and a separate device that we've been working on. Um, there is, it's, there's also a lot of overlap. Um, all of the software on that device is open source, and I think there's not a, a hard line between open source and commercialization. In fact, I feel like the way we're setting it up is really what a company should do is support in sales. and sales. If somebody has a different application or just wants the hardware and wants to go their own way with it, um, I think this is completely compatible with a commercial entity. Um, and you know, and to the extent that it's possible, it seems best for for both things. For you can support people that want um, want training and sales, and then you can also support people that just need the hardware and they they have their own plans for it. So I wanted to start by telling you kind of how I got into this and. Um, and really where this started. I'm not an engineer or electronics or anything by training. I'm a neuroscientist. Um, I didn't start messing around with electronics until I had my own lab. And there's some reasons for where I think 
some thoughts had been kind of brewing both in the community and in my own experience and my own um, sort of my own research program working on obesity, um, where I started thinking about our experiments and what was really the bottlenecks. And in this sort of idealized schematic, let me see if I have a little pointer. This idealized schematic, we usually think, you know, we start with a question of hypothesis, we acquire data on it, we come to some conclusion and we publish it. But what I found in our field, and this is, I think, due to me studying obesity and feeding, which um, has is kind of cursed by a lot of variants. Mice eat very different amounts, mice gain weight at different rates. Um, maybe all fields are kind of this way, but it's certainly true for obesity. What we found was that our results were, our variance was really killing us. We were kind of losing it on the data acquisition in part because in my mind, we couldn't acquire sort of enough data. We were studying 12 mice in this condition and 12 mice on this diet. And then you make a, a scatter plot and it's it's like, what, what am I looking at here? These are slightly higher than these ones. Um, and so we really have what, what I'd say is a power problem. And a lot has been written about this, especially in the context of behavioral neuroscience. This is a, a really wonderful um, analysis by Catherine Button and her colleagues. Um, I believe it was published in 2011. Um, I'm forgetting the exact date, but it's, it's quite old now. People have been aware of this. Um, and the topic of this was power failure, while small sample size undermines the reliability of neuroscience. And they talk about all types of neuroscience, but particularly behavioral neuroscience is, is, is um, kind of a, a weak point that many of our studies are simply not large enough in terms of animal numbers to answer the questions that they were set out to, to test. Um, and so they quantify this and they come back with a number that about approximately 11% of the studies in their analysis fit the requirements for being well-powered um, to study the, the question they were set out to test. And this is terrible um, to say that, you know, maybe 90% of studies aren't powered because what happens is we have a publication bias towards positive results that we're all aware of. If you're not powered to detect something and you detect it, it means in some ways you got lucky a little bit. You know, it could be a real effect that you got lucky and you detected, um, or it could not be a real effect and you got unlucky and detected it. Um, but what happens is if people try to replicate something that I want to say should not have been detected with the the, the study design, the chance that running the exact same number of mice on the exact same study, even with the same lab and the same people and it happening again is low. Um, you know, it was a lucky event once and depending on how poorly it was powered, um, it tells you whether it's lucky to happen twice in a row. Um, and that's exactly one of the, the sort of thorns in our side of behavioral neuroscience is that many things don't replicate from lab to lab. Um, so this is a quantification of that. I'm not going to spend too much time. I kind of just went through it. Um, but basically saying that the power to detect, um, the power to detect an effect down here on this bar on the on the right, it was about, I guess it was about 14% of the studies had, the, had sufficient power to detect something, a real event, 80% of the time. So they also make a recommendation in the study that what type of power would you need in a normal two group or you know sort of run of the mill two group behavioral neuroscience study and they come back with something about 130 animals per group um, and anyone who's played with power analyses online that type of thing knows that this number is not far off um, you know usually that's the big criticism you run the power analysis they oh my gosh it says says i need 50 animals per group or 100 animals per group and that can't be right um, and strictly speaking it probably is right um, so this just isn't feasible. And that, I think, is a big pressure. I think the reason that we don't power our studies that way is not because we don't understand it or don't want to understand it. It's, it's there's a reality here that nobody actually has the money to do this um, or the time to do it or the, the people to do it. So all of this was kind of bouncing around in my head and trying to think about this power problem and how can we solve it in my small field of, of mice gaining weight um, and just, you know, do we have to do this? Um, or can we make progress with the resources we have? Because it's quite depressing to think that we can't. And now what do you do? Your hands are a little bit tied. So I started thinking, and this is while I was at the NIH, and there were a couple other pressures on me at that time, um, which is that we really, the NIH um, campus is very, very crowded. And so even beyond coming to grips with these problems, um, we just didn't have a lot of space. So it wasn't you know, even if I was to say, maybe I go to my director and say, I've got a, 
a big problem we need to solve and I'm, I'm going to need all this money for equipment. That probably wouldn't work, but it could. But the bigger issue is just looking around. There's no nowhere to put 100 mice running in boxes, that type of thing. Um, and so I started thinking about how other fields have solved it. And the way that they have solved it is largely through miniaturization and automation. So this is, of course, the, the micro well plate, which has been you know, moved everything from test tubes into these high throughput assays. Um, and nobody could sit there in 1950 and think, how am I going to run, you know, 300 reactions at once or now 4,000 reactions at once? Um, but that's if exactly what's happened. And the way it's happened is through miniaturizing the reactions and automating the reactions. So we started thinking, you know, could we do this with animal behavior? This is the schematic of the traditional operant box, the traditional animal behavioral box. What would it take to really miniaturize this? Um, this is sort of where we are with one behavioral box. What would it take to fill up a 96 well plate? And of course, the, the other thing I mentioned, I was at the NIH campus, the, we had very little space to kind of expand the labs, but we actually had quite nice animal facilities. And we, you know, if you were willing to pay for the cages or justify their use, you could, you could expand in the, in the colony. Um, and so back and forth these ideas until at one point you're thinking, what would it take to make a rack into, you know, it's, it's 96 cages, what would it take to turn that into the 96 well plate for behavior? Um, what could we put inside the cages that could do this? And this started uh, what's now become a journey of maybe 10 years um, of at least thinking of this and developing things. And um, there's a lot of challenges. I love talking about them. So if anyone has questions or even later on wants to talk about this, please reach out. Um, but we came to this idea of a home cage vision. What if we did everything in the cage? We have the mice there, you know, they're living there. Most of us on this call probably have mice that are living in their cages right now, not being monitored. What would it take to start putting monitoring devices or even behavioral probing devices into the cage? Um, and so we started our first device was this pellet training device called Fed that um, Jamie mentioned. I have one here. This is a nice green one that I printed at home, um, but some of them look, um, you know, some of them, a lot of ours are printed commercially now, which um, I can also talk about the, if anyone has thoughts on sort of this thing of real DIY versus some hybrid of getting commercial companies to, to do parts of it. Um, but what this is, is a smart pellet dispensing device. It has, has a pellet dispenser on the top. Um, it's actually missing some parts. This one I have at home, I use for kind of piloting new code and things. So it's a little bit beat up and doesn't have all the parts. Um, but as a pellet dispenser up here, the pellets come out in this little well here. The mouse has two nose pokes it can interact with. It has some lights. It has tones. It has a screen on it, which is actually not for the mice. It's for the people. So you can see what's going on. And certainly for troubleshooting code, um, it's much easier to have to be able to pick up the device and see, you know, I'm trying to do some, some type of probabilistic thing. And it seems like the mouse is only getting pellets on the wrong schedule, that type of thing. Um, and then it's... It has a battery and an SD card inside for storing data. And the unique thing is it's completely self-contained. So many systems are kind of use a model of a central computer and then some edge devices that are all com communicating back. Um, we decided to take this approach where everything's self-contained in part because we're trying to get to this large scale vision. Um, and part of the vision would be eventually that these would be wirelessly connected. And you know when the system becomes sort of um, I want to say it doesn't have a central processor like that, it becomes much more robust as well, that if one device fails, that's okay. Hopefully it can, it can communicate in some way that it's failing, but the whole system just keeps going because it's all, you know, it's all autonomous little devices. We've also been working on activity sensing. We published an open source version, and that's actually the basis of this company now we're starting um, called Palladis, is a separate device that's in the top of the cage and does some activity sensing. I'll talk about that at the end. We became very aware of the environment. I think this is a really important variable that is almost never studied um, or almost never reported. I don't want to say it's almost never studied, um, but the people that study it tend to be people who care about thermogenesis, um, circadian rhythms, obesity, which is my field. The ambient temperature in the cage is an extremely important um, determinant of how much people, how much mice eat and how much um, their metabolism is burning. Um, and then we were thinking, can we come up with new tests in the cage? You know, things that we haven't thought of now, social tests, sort of more in the psychiatric domain, um, those types of, of tests. 
Ah, and the wireless connectivity, which has been a total hassle. It sounded easy. I probably put this on the slide, or I would have put it there in like 2015. And it's there's a lot to consider with wireless connectivity, especially with with many co-located devices. Um, so if you want to put 90 in a room, um, you know, how do they communicate? How do they all send their packets and and not um, and not get dropped? So I'm going to spend the next sort of um, 15 minutes or so. Um, on talking about Fed 3. Hopefully I don't go over, but again, jump in if there's questions as we're going. And so I want to tell you about Fed 3. This is sort of the device that we've put the most time into. I've certainly put the most time into. Um, and it's it's made somewhat of an impact. It's now being used by about, or so I, it's being sold commercially by Open E, who I'm not in any financial relationship with, but I'm very supportive of them as a company. I hope they, I hope they're doing phenomenally because they are performing a service for that I see um, for devices like this um, that really can't be. There's no one else really um, stepping in to disseminate. But they're selling these devices. They've sold about 1,400. I always feel like that. I don't know if that means there's 1,400, you know, sitting on a shelf somewhere, or there's 1,400 in studies. Um, but it's still a very impressive number that they've managed to disseminate. And we're starting to see papers with them, which is hopefully the sort of the next phase of seeing, um, yeah, seeing papers. So I, I introduced it briefly. Um, this is a nicer looking one in the photograph here. Um, but it's a smart pellet, pellet dispensing device. The things I really think are unique are that it's battery powered. It lasts about a week on a charge, and then you can plug it in and charge it or swap the battery. Um, so it's totally wireless. It drops into the cage. <laughs> Um, it's also open source and completely customizable. Um, so we have an Arduino library that basically abstracts a lot of the what the Fed is doing and lets you write, you know, functions like like log left poke, and that will log when he pokes on the left. So those types of high level functions, which do make it much easier to program. Um, and one of the more enjoyable things I think is seeing new people in my lab or people I interact with online. Um, you know, that don't have a huge background in programming and have found it found it fine um, and hopefully even can serve as an introduction into many more things you can do once you get started uh, programming your own devices. So for Fed3, all the design files and everything are freely available online. I'm going to, um, yeah, I'll kind of take you on a little tour of that um, in a bit. I talked about this, um, my field of obesity and why we made, why do we make 5.3? What problem are we trying to solve? Um, I kind of won't go over this again, but essentially we're trying to figure out why some mice become obese, why some mice don't uh, study the variants there. And we came up with this idea that we need to understand their feeding and why they're eating. And we need to be able to do it um, sort of continuously and in large numbers of animals. I will say this has been much, much harder than I, than I anticipated. I, I feel sort of, I feel like it's like, I feel fondly about my prior self being like, we'll make a device and we'll put it in all the cages. It has certainly been more challenging than that. Um, yet, I think the idea is still good and we haven't been completely knocked off the path yet. I'm still kind of step-by-step step, um, progressing towards that vision. So the vision, of course, is we want to record feeding continuously, meaning we, you know, mouse is on a diet for, for 12 weeks. We record every feeding event. Um, and we want to do it in home cages, which makes it sort of all these other um, considerations important. It needs to be inexpensive. It can be, has to fit in the cage. It has to um, be able to be customizable in various ways. And so the first person who kind of worked on this with me and um, sort of probably introduced me to the idea was I was very fortunate to have a postdoc in my lab, Katrina Nguyen, um, who joined my lab in 2016 at the NIH. Um, she had a background in biomedical engineering. And she was sort of, we were measuring food in, in little dishes. And anyone who's done this knows the, the mice pee in the dish, the, they take food out of the dish. There's all sorts of things. And, um, you know, so Katrina was an engineer by training and she was just shocked at, that I was hiring her to come weigh these little dishes. And she said, how about I make, you know, a device, if you get me a 3D printer, which it was sort of, was new to me at the time, um, you know, I'll, I'll build a device and then we don't have to weigh dishes. And I, both of us in our naivety, were like, great, this will, this shouldn't be hard. And she worked on this for about two years and made the first version of the Fed device. Um, it was totally turned me on to this idea that we can build devices ourselves and we can even customize them for exactly the, um, the application we want. 
Um, and this was the very first one. I'll show you a quick video of it. Do, do, do. So it was, it fit in the cage. It was quite a bit larger than, than our new fed um, devices. And all it did was dispense a pellet. And when the mouse removed it, it wrote the time that that happened to an SD card, and then it dispensed another one. And so if it keeps dispensing a pellet and then the mouse takes it and then it dispenses another one, over time, um, we could build up these records of, of, their, um, of their food intake. So this is now looking at seven mice or eight mice and looking at a circadian rhythm of three days. Um, this graph was quite a, a milestone for us because the early devices had tons of problems. And so even getting a device to go without jamming or something for three days was, was an achievement, uh, much less getting eight devices. And it was sort of the milestone that we set for ourselves as, you know, is this a useful thing that we should tell anyone else about? Um, can we even use it for three days? And if we can't, we're probably not there yet. So actually, I'm going to... I'm going to skip ahead. So that was sort of in 2016. I'm going to tell you a bit more about where we are. And so I feel like um, apologies for some of these being a little bit repetitive. I um, not in the huge practice of giving talks. And sometimes when you prepare one and then you go back, you're like, <laughs> these slides have already been done. Um, but what we came to is we now have a you know, this kind of evolved over the last six years into an operant version that's much more reliable, it's much smaller. Um, and the really unique thing about it is that traditional equipment, the mice, you know, removed from their cage and they go daily into this device, Fed3 stays in their cage. And therefore it can be used for long-term studies, which was our original goal with it. Um, this is a graph of looking at just pellet intake. Um, we were doing, we were playing with different high fat diet supplements to basically ask the question, if the mouse is getting 25 or 50 or even 90% of its diet from, from high fat diet that we give it, how does it affect the rest of its eating? Um, and so not, not surprisingly, when mice have a big supplement of high fat diet, they eat less. Here, we're looking at nine mice um, over six weeks. Um, so this was done with fed three, but just kind of on these really long experiments now. Um, and then just if anyone's piqued by the scientific question, the real question we're asking is, if we, if we give this high fat diet supplement, does their total calorie intake account for that? Are they able to sort of sense that and therefore eat less out of the fed three to an appropriate amount? Or do they overshoot because the high fat diet somehow does not activate um, satiety and meal termination in the same way as regular food? Um, but the point for this talk is that we, you know, we run these long things. And then what we realized by running these long experiments and, um, certainly when we got into training mice on more complicated tasks, is that having access to the device for 24 hours a day does wonderful things for training. Um, and in short, what I've come to believe is that the most important thing for training is how much the animal interacts with the device. And if they have 24 hours a day to interact with the device, they can interact with it you know, up to 24 times as, as quickly. And they in fact learn um, about 10 or 20 times faster. So this is one example. I'll show three examples of this. This is from Sinead Conway in Reem al Hassani's lab. And what Sinead did was in gray here, we're looking at one 24 hour period of a Fed3 device. And it's a very simple FR1, meaning they poke on one side, they get a pellet. And we just plot how much do they learn to poke on this side versus poking equally on, on both sides where the other side does not give them a pellet. And let me go back to our, let me go back to this laser pointer. So in gray here, we're looking at Fed3, um, one overnight session, and we see that they start out, you know, about 50% poking on both sides. And then within one day, they get quite good. About 80, 90% of their pokes are on the side that gives them a pellet. Um, Sinead also did the same exact test with a Fed3, but doing it in daily one hour sessions. Um, and she ran this for three weeks. And you can see that over the three weeks, they slowly, slowly start to recognize this preference for the active poke. Um, but it takes them about three weeks with these single hour sessions. So the simple conclusion is that you can take all those three weeks of one hour sessions and do them in one night if you'd like, and you get sort of the same amount of learning, at least on this um, simple task. So this is great um, to make them learn more quickly. And we've been using this in some much more complicated tasks. And I'll show two examples. Um, this one is data from my lab, Alex Lagaria, who's a graduate student. And we're running what's called a two-armed bandit task or um, probabilistic. Probabilistically, we change the 
the probabilities on each poke of delivering a pellet. Um, so it's a little bit small, but along the top here, this first phase, 70% of the time on the left, they get a pellet, 30% of the time on the right, they get a pellet. Then it flips such that the 70% on the left turns into 10% on the left, they get a pellet. So, you know, it's random, but they do, they poke, it decides, it rolls a dice and one out of 10, it will, it will deliver a pellet, nine out of 10, it won't. Um, and then 90% on the other side. And what we're plotting here is the probability of the left poke. So when it's low, on, when it's high on the left, like 70%, they should start to go and creep up towards poking on the left. Now it's low on the left, they should creep back down. Now it's high on the left, you know, so they should sort of be able to, an ideal animal would, would learn what the probabilities are and then not just go fully for the one that's better, but kind of titrate their amount of effort on both for towards the probabilities that they get pellets. Um, and we're finding we get quite good behavior on this in about three days. So, you know, 72 hours of, of full on home cage behavior. Um, we're getting quite good behavior on this task. And in the literature on this, people will train these mice for weeks on this task or sometimes getting into months um, to get high quality behavior or just to get evidence that the animal understands, um, you know, the rules, the game that's going on. So I think this was this was a real eye opener for how much more quickly we can train things in the home cage. And then the last one is something new that we've been doing, um, which is a stop signal task. And we have a protocol of training them in about nine days. I'm pretty sure we can shorten it. Um, but what this is, is getting at if an animal, it's a it was a task that's widely used in humans. And the game is that if you are at made, asked to make two actions, let's say you're at a computer and you're going to push X and then you're going to push M. And you get quite good at going X, M, X, M, X, M. But then on some trials, a tone is played in between after you push X, but before you push M. Can you stop your second hand from, you know, from going? It's, and so are you able to, to, to terminate an already launched behavior sequence that's that started? And so we wanted to do this with the Fed. And the way that we did this was to train them to go left, right, left, right, left, right. And they get pretty good at realizing they've got to do two pokes and we you know, can make them do it in a short time window. Um, and then we start introducing, on 70% of the time they get a regular trial where they go left and then within three seconds they have to go right and that gives them a pellet. But on 30% of the trials, they get a tone after they go left 500 milliseconds later, which is you know, usually in the time that they're transiting over to the other poke, um, they get a tone and they have to withhold. And if they, you know, if they complete the sequence, they don't get a pellet. If they withhold correctly, they do get a pellet. Um, and again, we trained this in the home cage. Um, we did a protocol of nine days, kind of incrementally moving them up to this final um, final game. But I believe we could actually have shortened some of those. Ah, and here's the data on the right. And what we're looking at is the number of times they go to the right poke on a regular trial versus a stop signal. So we had five mice and all of them get quite good or their you know, probability of, of withholding, of not completing the sequence when there's a tone um, about doubles. So they go about, um, yeah, hopefully I'm being clear on what that is. And so again, I mean, it's not so much the specifics of the task, but I think the home cage training really enables um, this. And I'm kind of intrigued by emails I get at times with people um, trying to do even, even more complicated things, which is of course very rewarding to hear um, about people kind of pushing this device. So the last point I wanna make about Fed3, and this was sort of an important um, step forward in disseminating an open source device is that it records a lot of information. So here we're looking at the screen after a week long task where we were doing incrementing progressive ratios where the mice would you know, get up to FR40 or so on the left. And so they end up pushing, doing a lot of left pokes. Here we have 24,000 left pokes over the week um, resulting in about 1100 pellets. And we record everything and that part's fine. That's not a big deal, but then what do you do with that? What do you do with you know, 24,000 events? And so I was very fortunate to have a technician, Tom Ernest, um, who's now a PhD student in data science. Um, you could kind of see his, his talents were already there, um, but he joined my lab and about six months, he joined my lab in 2019, about six months later, the labs and everything shut down um, for the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. And Tom took it on himself to, to kind of solve this problem and create a, a software that was specifically for analyzing Fed3 data files. Um, so he made something called Fed3 Viz, and it can take the raw data files off the Fed3, 
um, and make a lot of, of neat little um, visualizations and graphs. Um, so I'll just take you through a couple of them. One of them that I thought was um, quite nice was a big challenge in understanding feeding behavior is an idea that there's, there's more than just the total amount they eat. There's patterns in how they eat. They tend to eat a burst or what you might call a meal, just like us. We tend to concentrate our feeding in, in you know, sort of bursts throughout the day. Um, and then they might take a long gap. And people have addressed this with a, an idea of meal pattern analysis. And usually it's something like a meal is, you know, maybe some hard cutoffs. It's gotta be more than half a gram eaten within 10 minutes or some sort of criteria. And when you start reading the papers, you find that people have used very different criteria in different papers. Um, food is often dispensed differently. It may not be so easy to use exactly the same criteria for every, every type of experiment. Um, and Tom and I came up with a pretty neat analysis, um, very simple, but we said, what if we make a histogram of all of the intervals between pellets? So if a mouse takes a, a pellet, you know, when you first put it in and a minute later he takes a pellet, that's 60 seconds. If he waits 10 minutes and then takes another pellet, that's now 120 seconds. And just keep plotting these and adding up these histograms. And what we found is that every mouse has a shape that looks roughly like this. And they tend to have a large peak that hovers around 40, 30 to 60 seconds. Um, and that is what you might call within meals. These are when they take a pellet, they take another one, you know, 30 to 60 seconds later. It takes them about 10 to 20 seconds to eat the pellet. So kind of this is fairly rapid eating behavior that they're, they're taking a pellet and then taking another one and then taking another one. And for depending on how we, you know, the experimental conditions, they all have a peak here and it's always, um, it's usually more than half of their food is taken in that. And then they have a slower peak out here. And this is now between 10 and 100 minutes. And so these are the gaps. These are, they now took a break and the break could last 10 minutes. Often it lasts an hour. It might last two hours. I'm getting out towards 100 minutes. Um, and those are the gaps in between meals. So looking at these and certainly looking at different, when you have a comparator group, um, looking at two different conditions, um, you can very quickly get an idea of, you know, how much they're, the two groups differ on whether they're eating within meals or outside of meals. Um, the, other, the other big point I wanted to make was sort of the value that Tom brought to kind of close the loop on, there's a hardware component, there's a whole code and make the hardware run component, and then there's data. And ultimately for the device to, to fully function for experiments, we need some way to, to wrangle the data in the end. And I think Tom plugged a really important hole and kind of accelerated our understanding of our data, but also I've seen talk with many people and found that this program has been very helpful. I will say, unfortunately, he went to, you know, fortunately he went to graduate school. He's doing great, um, but it's also been a challenge to kind of maintain this and keep it going, um, which is a more general problem of when one person creates a software, it's not always so easy for, for next person just to pick it up. So let me... I am going to, that's about what I want. Uh, these are some pretty pictures of different ways we can analyze data. That's about what I wanted to, to talk about with PED3. Um, last thing I want to mention is it's open source. It was designed to be modified. It is being sold commercially, but it's sort of, that's not its primary sort of purpose. Um, and uh, so, so these are some photos I've gotten from people. Kevin Myers at Bucknell made a, you know, a modification of this for rats. I. I actually have not touched base with them in a bit, so I'm not sure how well this is working, but that kind of expanded everything and just kind of using the same electronics. Um, a group in China um, redesigned the pellet dispensing. And I think this is really cool that all the 3D files are online. And um, in my dream, it, you know, this would, um, we would sort of crowdsource and optimize things. And if there's sort of somebody has a better way to, to do something, we could sort of, we could propagate it back. Um, also, the code is open source, and I've, that has been working in that way. I've started to get sort of suggestions from and additions from people, um, and now there's that's a great problem. But now it's sort of me testing and figuring out how to integrate them into the library. And then I'll leave you with, um, you know, how can you use Fed three? I mentioned that you can go onto the GitHub and download everything. There's a, a forum that you can join. I'm always available to help people get started. The other, um, the other part I'll mention is that Open EFIS is selling the hardware and or an assembled version. Um, I put their prices here for information. I mentioned I'm not involved with them financially, but I'm very supportive of what they're doing um, to disseminate this and other open source things. Um, and they've managed 
or they've been doing this for about two and a half years. They've distributed about 1,400 devices. Um, one of the really fun things is that they ship internationally. Um, and so devices are, you know, they've gone, gone to more than 20 countries. Um, they, they have a little, we have a Google sheet we share and it shows the countries and it's very exciting to me to see a new country that has not been on there before. Um, I think we've got one up here at the top of the world, which might be Jamie. Um, I think we've got 14 of them now from, uh, or 16 <laughs> from Open EFIS. Yeah, that's us. Um, and then if anyone's on this call and sort of wants to chat, you can certainly reach out to me, but we have a Google group that you could sort of read about some, some of the things. Um, at times it becomes active and then at times there's no one writes anything for a couple months. Um, but if you want to read about some of the sort of questions or problems people have had, um, you can certainly join it. You don't have to have the feds to, to sort of peek in there. So in the last, um, say, five minutes, I just want to talk a new thing and maybe spark some discussion commercialization. I mentioned that we had some other ideas um, for more things. And the first idea we came to was, could we put a little wireless device in the cage that would transmit environmental and some form of behavioral data to the cloud? Um, and we worked with a company called MCCI, um, who's a company based in New York to design the hardware. Um, I mentioned this is, I'm not a hardware electrical engineer or anything by training. I can hack around, but I think when you get into wireless data transmission and um, sort of real things, this hit my limit at least. Um, and so working with them has been has been wonderful. And I think they their approach is is completely correct for both managing how the data transmits and things like power consumption that become critical in a wireless system. You don't want to change batteries every three days or something like that. Um, and so what we came up to, I'm going to pop the little device out of here. So what we came up with is a device that has an activity sensor. It has environmental sensors. It has a wireless radio. It actually has inputs on the, on the side that we can um, transmit other data, like Fed3 was kind of in our ideas for, for a long time. Um, and I'll quickly take you on a tour. Do, do, do. So this data is all transmitted to a cloud server, and then the server is running a database program and a visualization engine um, called Grafana. It's a commercial product. What it lets us do is pull up these real-time graphs of um, activity. You can kind of click around and search through them. This has also been... Um, Pretty, pretty useful for going back to things. So we can, we've been running this server for about two years and um, I can I can look at last two years of data and kind of see um, where we were, um, especially you know, where people were coming in and, and putting devices on our network and taking them off. So this is sort of the, I think an important part of this vision of things is that you need some way to aggregate data. Um, the, the sort of commercial term for this or the industry term for this is the internet of things, but each one of these is a thing and they should be connecting to the internet and reporting things. Um, I think we're all very familiar with this, with things like Fitbits or, I mean, cell phones are the extreme of this, um, sending and transmitting data. Um, but even something like a Fitbit, I think is very similar to, to this, where it's, you know, it's an activity tracker. It has a small amount of data or a small amount of types of data and it's gonna transmit them to a database that now can serve them up when you want to look at certain things. Um, this was sort of, this gets into the commercialization. Um, this was very hard to disseminate open source. I will say actually all of this software is open source, but disseminating, you know, how do you set this up? How does a new lab set this up? Um, it's not as simple as here's a, you know, a PDF of the steps you would take. And so it ended up kind of motivating us after setting up several different labs with this, it sort of motivated us to think about maybe we need a company that could actually do this um, and make this a, you know, a, a thing that people could use. So I'm going to end here um, and kind of review um, this point that mostly we've been focusing on has been this data acquisition and could moving things into the home cage improve this and hopefully get us towards, you know, this bottleneck of could we do 130 mice in an experiment? Um, and again, I don't think we're there yet, but I can see that we're a lot further along and certainly all the parts are there um, to where you know we have the space, we have technology that could do it. Um, there's still a need for more automation. One person can't be taking care of 130 
electronic devices, but I can kind of see how these are the, the next level of question is to sort of smooth these, these challenging points um, and get to where it could be kind of fine. You could actually run the power analysis and say, okay, I'll like, I'll, let's go ahead with this um, and get a real answer on something. So I'm gonna end there. Um, I'm gonna acknowledge a lot of people have worked on Fed3. Um, certainly Katrina made the first one. Um, but many other people, um, Mohammed, um, Philippe, who's at Open EFIS, um, has been indispensable not just for for running the Open EFIS thing and um, and disseminating these, but we've had many discussions about improving it. He kind of fixed some of the power handling and um, has been a real contributor to to making Fed three what it is. And then I'll just mention on the um, other side on this new thing we're starting, Paladis, which should sort of be this aggregation. Um, MCCI has been our, our partner in this, um, and other people from, from both my lab and MCCI have worked on this. So I'd be happy to take questions. And again, I put my email here. Um, if anything sparks you know, later on, um, always feel free to reach out. I'm very happy to talk about open source um, or commercial um, device dissemination.